here. <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Not bad. Last time I said, good morning, everybody. And uh, he replied very nicely. Pastor Mott sent me an email and he said, knock them dead. So I was going to say, if I didn't hear anything, you're not supposed to be dead yet. <laughs> In that uh, hymn we just sang, by the way, my name is David Evano. I think I was already introduced. Um, in the fourth verse, a heart in every thought renewed. So that relates to my topic for today. Uh, let me grab my outline here, take a little bit of H2O. I'm very uh, super glad to be able to do this. Uh, and by the way, welcome to the visitors, David Lane and your family. It's good to see you. Uh, so you've heard Pastor Mott pray a number of times to the Lord to somehow use me, somehow in some way just use me. And I've adopted that as my prayer. So this is an answer to my prayer to be able to be used of God. And in some ways it's a little bit selfish because we know that we're supposed to make our calling in the election sure. So if I'm being used by God, that is a in, you know, it's an incentive for me to think I'm making my calling and election sure by being available for his service. So I'm very happy to be able to do this. Thank you, Pastor Ma. Uh, so in part one, uh, last May, I brought the message called Frame Your Doings. And uh, Brother Jim told me that somebody requested I do a brief review. So that's what I already had planned to do that. So I will start off by listing the topics. So I have seven sections. Uh, by the way, can everybody hear me okay in the back? Okay, good. So I have seven sections. Uh, I'll read them off. Brief review of part one. Number two, be not deceived. Number three, what are we feeding into our brains? And number four, avoiding deception. Number five is faith. Number six is educating your children. And number seven is the end times. So uh, the part one was in, in length, an hour and 26 minutes. And my uh, sort of thought about that was I'm not going to rush. I'm going to take my time and just go through it and not worry about the time. And it was, I didn't expect it to take that long. So that was, my notes were nine pages long in that case. For part two, double-sided, 20 pages long. <laughs> so, sorry John, but I'm going to have to talk twice as fast. <laughs> Or we can do what uh, they do in the Edmonton Church. Pastor Brian will take a break, they'll have a snack, and then he'll continue. So, Scott, 1230, can you order the pizza? I'll buy. <laughs> so seriously, let's get into it. Uh, section one, brief review. So this all started with the reading of Hosea. I was just going through the Bible cover to cover, and I came across this verse in Hosea uh, chapter 5, verse 4. They will not frame their doings to turn unto their God. And that, that really stuck with me, and so I was digging more and more into it and actually ended up developing part one. So let me give you a couple definitions. Define the word frame. It's to shape or direct one's thoughts, actions, powers, etc., to a certain purpose. To direct one's steps, to set out upon a journey, to shape one's course. And then also, to turn unto their God. Now, that sounds like repentance, to turn unto their God. So the defined repent is to affect oneself with contrition or regret for something done. So in part one... Uh, so, so let me read that, read that again. They will not frame their doings. In other words, shape their doings, shape their life to turn unto their God. 
So how does that apply to Christians? We can apply that to our lives every single day. And uh, today what I'd like to do is zero in on, oh, sorry, I skipped over a part. I have to write everything down, otherwise I will miss it. In part one, I talked about how can we as Christians frame our doings. And then I broke it down into three parts, framing our thoughts, our tongues, and our actions. And I talked about each one of those briefly. But today, I want to zero in on the first one, framing our thoughts. So, Lord willing, I would like to somehow, dump, sometime down the road, if I can be used, do one on framing our tongues and do one on framing our actions. More of a deeper dive into each one. So today, I, I uh, uh, imagine a border around your mind. So a frame is a border. And so the idea here is that you need to keep some thoughts in and keep some thoughts out. So that's a primary thing we'll be talking about today. Uh, this topic is, it just keeps going and going and going. And I had to put, I had to frame the size of this message because it just keeps going. The more I dig into it, the more it leads to other things. You know how it is when you read the Bible, everything's connected. So, uh, and again, this message is going to be along the lines of very practical advice for daily Christian living. Um, I'm going to try to keep note of the time here, so it's 10.22. Uh, try to wrap it up by 11.30. Yesterday I did a dry run. It was an hour and 10 minutes. I've added a little bit, changed a few things, so hopefully we'll be, we'll be doing well on time. Uh, so this is an extremely important message, um, and as one of the bullet points that I mentioned of a dealing with deception, this is a huge topic. So, um, and you need this in your Christian walk. Every I need it. Every one of us needs this. So this is a good segue uh, from last Sunday's service, and one of the verses that Pastor Mott brought out was Philippians four eight. Can you please turn to that verse? To save time, I'll go ahead and start reading. I, I printed out all my verses. There's a couple things I will need to turn to. Uh, finally, brethren, talking about your thoughts, your mind. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, and it, it'd be good to look up the definition of each one of those words and maybe talk about it with your family. I don't have time to really go through and explain every definition of every word there today, but that would be a good devotion to do. Um, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, which is doing the right thing, because it's the right thing to do. And if there be any praise, think on these things. No, we're already on page three. That's awesome. Uh, so the next topic, oh yeah, I did forget one thing. I had a request to do a little bit more review on the first part. So what I'm going to do is just go through my sections from the last time. So what does it mean to frame your doings? I explained that this, this morning. God is a framer. He makes borders and boundaries. Then we talk about examples of people not framing their doings. In other words, getting outside of what they should be doing. Moses was an example when he smote the rock twice. And you remember I said he was commanded to speak to the rock. So if you're not careful, you can get your mind out of where it should be and do things that are going to be injurious or not help, helpful or healthy for you. And I, and I said, well, maybe, just, just my you know, uh, thought about it, is maybe this is the second time the water's to come out of the rock, and maybe Moses hit, struck the rock. He was supposed to speak to it. It didn't work. Well, if it worked the last time, he struck it again. That's just my imagination. But, you know, that's very uh, possible. And then I talked about uh, how can we as Christians frame our doings, and I went through some examples along those lines. And there was one thing I brought up, and I'll bring up again. So in the Old Testament, there's a, a, 
a description of these people that could not pronounce the word shibboleth. They couldn't say the SH sound. And there's a fellow that I used to work with. I think he was from that area of the world. Because he could pronounce, he could not pronounce the SH sound. And I went down to his desk one day, and he was so frustrated with his project, he couldn't get it working. And he just kept saying, sit, sit. <laughs> so I have firsthand experience of somebody that cannot pronounce SH. Okay, so back to today's, uh, and by the way, part one is online on the website, so. Uh, Mary Dell said she's already reviewed that. That was very good. Thank you. Um, so the next topic or the section is be not deceived. One of the worst things that can happen to a person, especially one who bears the name of Jesus Christ, that being a Christian, is to think he's doing right. Okay? This is so important to understand what deception is, and we're going to do a deep dive into this. Um, but in reality, he's doing wrong. You think you're doing right. I mean, you really think you're doing right. You're praying. You're reading the Bible. You're doing everything you think a Christian should do. But if you're deceived, you think you're doing right, but you're actually doing wrong. This is so important to be aware of. This is deception at work. He does not know he's deceived. That's the whole idea. In fact, I looked up the definition of deceived and that lead to deceive and deceit basically the OED says it's concealment of the truth in order to mislead now Jesus said I am the truth right so it's no wonder and I'll, I'll talk about the the media and all that stuff but it's no wonder that the true Jesus is not talked about out there in in media land right because as I'm going to say, the devil is the power, prince of the power of the air. You know, he's, he's in charge of the airwaves and the media and all the broadcasts. And uh, so he does not want the true Jesus to be revealed to people. So he is a deceiver. He's concealing the truth in order to mislead. So we'll talk more about that. Then actually, and there's a Bible definition uh, about this, Jeremiah 9.5. And they will deceive everyone his neighbor and will not speak the truth. There you go. Telling lies, deceiving, misleading. They will deceive everyone his neighbor and will not speak the truth. They have their tongue, sorry, they have taught their tongue to speak lies and weary themselves to commit iniquity. That'll be a good one for part three about the tongue. Okay. Uh, deception is a huge problem in our culture today and it seems to me probably you too that if you look at the course of the world right that we are leading more and more and more to the end times expect to see more and more and more mass deception and we'll talk about that in the end times so there is nothing new under the Sun open your Bibles to Jeremiah 5 27 It's amazing how dry you get doing this job. <clears throat> I'll start reading. As a cage is full of birds, so are the houses full of deceit. Therefore they are become great and wax and rich. They are wax and fat. They shine, yea, they overpass the deeds of the wicked. Does that stop for a minute? Does that sound like the time in which we're living today? Right? You think about, I mean, you hear about all these prosecutors that are paid off and they let the criminals go free and they actually interview criminals and they say, I'm not afraid of getting caught because I know I'm going to be out in two hours. So the jails are just a revolving door. Doesn't that sound like today? They overpass the deeds of the wicked. They judge not the cause. We got problems with our judges, right? The cause of the fatherless, yet they prosper. And the right of the needy do they not judge. Shall I not visit for these things? Saith the Lord, shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? <clears throat> Let me interject for something that I just thought of. Um, you know, going back to the Trump and the MAGA movement and all that stuff, um, 
you think about Make America Great Again. I want you to define for me what you mean by great. You know, is great just doing what you want, having a party, the wine and the oil's increased, or is great being a godly nation, right? That should be first, right? Okay, I had to interject that. The thought just came to my mind. Um, verse 30, a wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. Now, this verse here, 31, gets me. The prophets prophesy falsely, okay? They're telling lies. They're concealing the truth. They're misleading. And the priests bear rule by their means. What does that sound like? They're not adhering to God's rules. Does that sound like the Pharisees that Jesus upbraided? They teach for commandments the traditions of men. So now this is the part that gets me ch choked up. There's two parts in the Bible that I get choked up on. The one is when Peter denied the Lord three times in the cock crew. That I cannot get through reading that without ch getting choked up. And this is another one. And my people love to have it so. That is so tragic to me. My people love to have it so. Why? Because they're deceived. That's why this, this topic of deception is so important. And if you think you can't fall into it, you are deceived. You have to be careful. You have to guard against it. I'll be talking about a warfare. Okay. So, the prophets prophesy falsely, and priests bear rule by their means, and my people love to have it so. What will ye do in the end thereof? <clears throat> okay, what do people say when they realize they were deceived? They say, I really thought I was doing the right thing. I mean, it's good when you realize that you've been deceived and you're out of it. But how many times have you said in your life, think about it, maybe some of you, you know, have done this, I really thought I was doing the right thing, you know? How many people are injured and hurt because somebody thought they were doing the right thing? They thought they were doing the will of God. They just wanted to help. Sometimes maybe it's not good to help, especially if you are not thinking right. Let's look at an example of a deceived person. Saul of Tarsus. Okay? He really thought, turn, turn to uh, Acts 22.3. He really thought he was zealously doing the will of God. And we all knew he was deceived. And I'll read these verses here. I am verily a, a man which am born a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Sicilia, and brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, Gamaliel and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God as ye all are this day. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. So, and we know that he was going after the Christians to persecute them, right? So, oh, I said right. So my criticism from Pastor Mike was, don't keep saying the word right. So I got to keep that in mind. So there's one mistake. Okay. Uh, um, and by the way, thank you. That was a good positive criticism. Um, okay. And it came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone a heaven from heaven a great light round about me. So you recall this is when Jesus intervened, right? <sighs> and I fell unto God and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. Now I want to go to open, go to your uh, go to verse First Corinthians fifteen and nine. And Paul is saying here, for I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle. Why? Because I persecuted the church of God. Now you link those two ideas together. The church is in Jesus Christ. If you persecute, persecute the church, you're persecuting Jesus Christ. 
how does that make us look at the church? We love the church. We love our brethren, right? We don't want to harm them. Because what you do to your brethren, you're doing to your Savior. This is such an extreme point. And my note here is how you behave toward the church is how you behave toward Jesus Christ. Now, um, Dr. Dave, the uh, marriage counselor, will make a point here. So the last time I brought up a verse, let's turn to it. Uh, 1 Peter 1.22. This is one that I'm going to have to turn to. 1 Peter 1.22. So what I did the last time was I used Brother Justin Sperry as an example that we are to love each other. I think it goes with a pure heart fervently. So uh, for married couples... This is a guarantee to make your marriages better. Guaranteed. Money back. Well, I didn't receive any money, so I can't give any money back. Uh, so if you view, to the spouses, right, if you view your spouse instead of a husband or a wife at times as a sister or brother, right? <sighs> you got to quit saying, right? That is hard to do, right? So... <laughs> Uh, anyway, if you view your spouse as a child of the living God, as a member of the church, as your brother and sister in Christ, and then you apply that verse, that you will love them with a pure heart fervently, your marriage will get better. Okay? Oh, good. I didn't say right. So let's move on because time is whew, moving along here. God tells us in his word to be not deceived. This is extremely important. In fact, there are four verses that have the words, be not deceived. And I'll go through those quickly. Luke 21, 8. And he said, take heed that you be not deceived. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. And the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. And I'm going to bring that verse up again later on. Galatians 6, 7, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And then 1 Corinthians 6, 9, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And then you have the be not deceived, neither fornicators and so on shall inherit the, you know, the kingdom of God. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, be not deceived, evil communications, corrupt good manners. And I'd like to spend a little bit of time on that verse now. So normally, when you think about evil communications, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Talking like a sailor, right? Think of filthy language, swearing, taking Jesus' name in vain, etc. And it's true that those types of evil communications will corrupt your good manners. But you know, there's another thing that occurs to me. Evil communication can happen by taking good words and misusing them. I have an example of that. Um, the devil tried this on Jesus in the wilderness. Remember he tried quoting scripture to Jesus? In Matthew 4, 5, Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, Cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands shall they bear thee up, lest thou at any time, lest at any time thou should dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus replied to the devil and said, It is written. So you combat with scripture, right? It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So it's true that the angels would do this, but you don't tempt God by putting that to the test intentionally. You know, that's like uh, presumptuous sinning. So I thought about that uh, verse that Satan quoted, and I'm wondering, is he quoting from the King James? So I looked it up, and there's a difference in wording. So the actual verse in Psalm 91 that's referenced here, verse 11 for he shall give his angels charge over thee. 
to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. So you compare the words between the two versions. The modern versions use the word concerning thee. The King James uses the words over thee. Compare that. They don't say the same thing. Right? So uh, the devil used the wrong Bible. <laughs> He's using, you look at them up, the, the, the New International Version, the New Revised, all of these, right? They, they all have the same word. They're using the word concerning, verse, concerning thee versus over thee. Satan is a deceived deceiver. He himself is deceived. He's an idiot. He's not even using the right word of God, the right Bible. Okay. Now I want to talk about Adam and Eve at the garden. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Satan, the deceiver, will appeal to your desires. And that's what he did to Eve. So one of the things you have to be aware of is... Uh, well, let me read the verse. And the woman, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat, and committed the sin, and he died. So. Uh, those words, don't they, don't they sound so good? But beware. You have to beware of, here, there's an old saying, remember, if something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Kids, keep that in mind. Deceivers will twist the truth. Deceivers will change the truth of God into a lie, as it is recorded. I think it's recorded in Romans. Deceivers, and this is a big one, you've got to make sure they don't tell you the whole story. You know, they're concealing truth to mislead you. They may say part of the truth, but not the whole truth. That's very important to be aware of that. And then beware of people who are so interested in you and what you're doing. Oh, you know, I've heard stories about people that that I've known in the past, and oh, that's what they do. They get close to you, and they want to be all about interested in what you're doing and using flattery and buttering you up. You know, you hear that phrase, they butter somebody up, and I wondered, where did that come from? Well, I guess when you butter something up before you cook it. So they want to butter you up to cook you. Okay, page seven, moving right along here. Um, Okay, here's a good example of somebody taking good words and making it into an evil communication. Now, please, I'm not saying that the words in the Bible are evil. I'm saying they're taking good words, misusing them to get an idea into your head that's wrong. That whole thing is an evil communication because of what was delivered to you in the deception. Romans sixteen seventeen. Please, please turn to there to that verse. Now, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. So here's people that you need to avoid, for they are such. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly. You see, the deceiver has a self-interest in mind. He's serving his own belly. But by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Okay, be wise. Verse 19, For your obedience is come abroad unto all men, and I am glad therefore on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. Okay? So, I'm going to talk about training your children. This is so important that they can discern good from evil and be wise as they grow up, right? And go out into the world. Wisdom. 
buy the truth and sell it not. Okay. Now go to uh, John 3.16. This is going to be my example. A preacher can take good words and misapply them to deceive, right? To mislead you. Because what? They conceal the truth. They don't tell you the whole story. John 3.16. Let's read that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, right? So, so, um, uh, you know, you've heard this, the, the, the free willers and, and so forth, right? Everybody has um, heard of this happening. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and, and they, will bring, they will try to explain this verse to you. You see, it says, whosoever believeth. All you have to do is believe Jesus and accept him into your heart. And then you'll have everlasting life. Well... That's, that's a lie. That's an evil communication. It's deceiving. So, we are taught to compare Scripture with Scripture. Turn to verse, to, sorry, to Hebrews 1, chapter 1, verse 3. <clears throat> Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. Here's what I want to zoom in on. When he had by himself purged our sins. Nobody else is involved. They get everything all scrambled up. They confuse, as, as we know, they confuse eternal salvation with temporal salvation. That's not my topic. But um, when he had by himself purged our sins, is that hard to understand? No, it's very simple. By himself, he purged our sins. So, And we know that no, there's no sin in heaven. So in order to get to heaven, you have to have no sin. Jesus purged, it, purged our sins by himself. That means you had no part in that, in that operation. Nothing you could do or say or believe or confess or accept Jesus. No part in it. So you have preachers all over the land explaining how you can be a part of getting eternal life. And it's not, that, that, that is not, you're not involved in that. So I thought of this question last night as I was going through this. How is that preacher that's, that's deceiving you not committing idolatry. Think about it. What's idolatry? Well, one definition is the worship of a physical object as a god. A broader definition might be ascribing something that belongs only to God. It's only an attribute of God to something else or somebody else. So when you're part of the eternal salvation, you're being told you have a part in what only God God does. You see that? Isn't that idolatry? Amen. So, they will say Jesus only offers eternal life, but it is actually accomplished by something the sinner can do, and that's a lie. Beware, the devil uses scripture to deceive. Let's turn over to Acts 17.10 and talk about the noble Bereans. And, and we know what they did. Let's read this verse here. Okay. 10 and 11. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. This applies to the next section as, as well, which I'll talk about, which is how to avoid being deceived. These noble Bereans, they were not going to be, they were checking out what they were taught. And we need to do the same thing. You go to church, you get taught, you get a lesson. It's up to us to check that out and verify it. And Pastor Mott would tell you the same thing. Check him out with the Bible. 
That's what Christians need to do. Otherwise, you may fall into the trap of being deceived, being misled, because somebody didn't tell you the truth. It's extremely important. I just can't emphasize that enough. Okay, page 8. Okay, next section is, what are we feeding into our brains? Okay, you think about today. You know the old saying, garbage in, garbage out. What you take in, in your head, is going to come out in your speech. So, don't you want to make sure you're speaking right things? That means you've got to take in right things. Okay, so uh, let's go over to, uh, never mind, I'll just read this one. Ephesians 2.2, 2, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the, good to know it's with, you know, in time past uh, for us, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Think about all the ways in today's, technological society that information is transmitted. Computers, internet, cell phones, television, screens everywhere, devices everywhere, even at the gas pumps. I mean, I can't go fill up my car with gas, take the nozzle out, and a screen comes up and it's blaring something, maybe an advertisement or something. It's hard to escape it. It's just too much. It's overwhelming. Remember, uh, those of you that maybe have been involved in, in technology years ago, I'm thinking maybe 20 some years ago, um, the term was the internet, people call it the information superhighway. Welcome to the information superhighway, right? The information is blasting at us faster and faster. What does technology, but okay, technology gives the devil an advantage in that his lies, his deception can now spread throughout the culture much faster than ever before. And now we're going to 5G. Faster allows information to be broadcast even faster. Okay, talk a little bit about the mainstream media. We hear how bad the mainstream media is. And it is. There's, there's lots on there. I've, I stopped watching the news a couple years ago because I saw the lies that were being told. I would hear somebody say something, then it was reported later on that night, and they twisted it, and they left out information, and they told a lie. I'd say, I'm not going to watch it anymore, and I haven't. I haven't watched the news for two years. Amen. In fact, we got rid of our television. I mean, we still have a screen, but we subscribe to a, uh, Netflix, and we currently were watching episodes of Monk. You know, just it's, it's hard to find good content to watch these days, isn't it? I mean, they throw so much junk at you. Anyway, I'm getting off uh, topic here. Um, and it's true that the mainstream media, but you know, it, the same thing can happen with conservative media. You know, conservative media, you can get deceived, you can, they can broadcast lies, right? You have to discern. Um, True journalism is gone. They talk about the narrative and the optics. You know, and if you're, I'll talk about politics in a little bit, but if you're involved with keeping up with politics and what's happening with elections and all that stuff, you frequently hear, okay, the Democrats want to run this narrative, so they want to slant everything to promote their narrative. Or the Republicans, they want to slant everything to promote their narrative. You got to be really careful about that. And for me, I, you know, I have an interest in watching what happens with elections and politics, but you know, I have to be very careful about that too. The misinformation. People, this has turned, frankly, into mind control. It really has. It really, and, and we're supposed to, I'm going to talk about girding up the lines of your mind. You're supposed to put borders on that stuff and not let that stuff in. You know, what do you think about? Where do you spend your time? Millions and millions of people in our country are feeding on this junk and being deceived. This will lead into what's coming in the end times. 
nations, as we'll see in Revelation, nations upon nations are going to be deceived. Let me save that for later. There's a video called Social Dilemma. I haven't seen it yet, but I hear it's really good, so I, I need to watch that, and I guess that's highly recommended. Now we're going to get into a little bit about conspiracy theories. Need a little bit more water here. I don't really like watching conspiracy theories. I just it's just way too out there most of the time for me to even think about. I mean they're by, by the way, why are they all called theories? We know there are real conspiracies. So they're not all theories, but anyway. You can find so many of them of every kind on the internet. If you want to look for conspiracy theories, they are all there, thousands of them. Okay. Uh, even the conservatives, they claim they know what's going to happen. Conspiracy theory, we know what's going to happen. Back in around August, I watched a financial guy talk about our economy, and he said, and I made, I made a note of it so I could check it, he said the U.S. economy was absolutely going to collapse by October of 2021. October has come and gone. We're still here. We're still spending money, going to restaurants, buying food, going shopping. So it hasn't collapsed. Uh, Pastor Mott emailed me a paper written by Elder David Pyle titled Conspiracy Theories. And he really makes some good points. And I'm going to switch over to that. I printed that out. And I want to draw out uh, something he said about conspiracy theories. I'll, I'll read the first sentence. We hear much discussion these days about conspiracy theories, and some of the arguments offered for them are uncomfortably convincing. You know, they say it in such a way that, that it's pretty convincing. But again, are they trying to deceive are they themselves deceived, thinking they're telling you the truth? But you know, it, it goes on. This is the devil's. This is the devil's plan. It's deception upon deception. <clears throat> the likely reason is that some of these theories are very close to being true. Get that? Very close to being true. You've heard about you know you get the poison with the sugar, right? It's it's blended, and. Uh, Okay, let me, let me continue. Uh, notwithstanding, the predictions of conspiracy theorists are not notoriously inaccurate, and if their followers would be completely honest, they would admit to having lost much opportunity on account of them. Okay, he has uh, a reason here about why the predictions so commonly fail. The first is that they overstate the intelligence of the conspirators. Paul said, but evil men and seducers wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. There's, there's that problem cropping up again. Hence, the conspirators may be clever deceivers, but they are themselves the dupes of deception. It kind of sounds like a title, doesn't it, to you? Like the Duke of Ellington, the dupe of deception. Okay. Um, and then also, as Paul said elsewhere, in Ephesians 6.12, for we wrestle not against f flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness, the rulers of darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. So we know where the, where the battle really is, don't we? We've been taught that. Okay, so I want to I just dive in a little bit on those two, on those two uh, verses here. So 2 Timothy 3.13 but evil men and seducers wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So these are evil men, deceivers, they themselves are deceived. They're also seducers. Waxing worse and worse means it's just going to get more and more and more as time goes on. Now it's interesting that this verse lines up very nicely with Galatians 6-7. Be not deceived. There's one of our be not deceived verses. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. The man sowing deception, what's he going to receive? What's he going to reap? He's going to reap deception. He himself will be deceived. Isn't that interesting? You sow 
what you reap. And there's some modern sayings that go along those lines. What goes around comes around. The golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You know, don't deceive your neighbor. By the way, I wanted to say something to the kids, and I've thought about this, uh, about truth. When I think about truth, I think about it as being a very comforting thing that I just want to take to my bosom and hug. Truth is your friend. Learn to love it. And Jesus said, I am the truth, right? So then, um, the, um, I said right now, through my train of thought off. So, uh, you know, the, the truth is something you love. Jesus is the truth. Embrace it. Hug it. It's your friend. Love it. Hang on to it. That, that's how I think about truth. Uh, okay. For we wrestle, Ephesians 6.12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So during the past few years, I've watched a number of conservative videos, and I only heard one time, one person, say that verse, where our fight really is. That was Governor Mike Huckabee. Good for him. He was on Fox, and he stated that verse. And I thought that was excellent. It was a King James Version he quoted from, and that was great. He was telling, broadcasting, where the fight really is. If you follow politics, uh, and by the way, I put a note here. And as I mentioned earlier, when you listen to out there, meaning, you know, speakers, media, television, whatever, you don't hear the truth. You don't hear what the real problem is. The real problem is, is not going to be solved by government and by politicians and by, right? This is so frustrating. <laughs> it's like it's just built into me. Um, the, uh, the answer is not... Democrats versus Republicans. You know, there's a verse that I was thinking of a few weeks back, and I wanted to add this in, and I can't think of it right now, but it had to do with uh, the nations just bouncing back and forth. It reminded me of our political culture. For years, it just goes, Democrats are in power, Republicans are in power, Democrats are in power, bouncing back and forth and back and forth. Do you think that may be a distraction to what the real problem is? So we really need to look above politics and government to know what the problem really is. And we know that it's sin. It's disobeying God's laws and individually, corporately, the whole country. Okay, page 10. In uh, Luke 21, 8, and he said, Take heed that you be not deceived. So this is another one of our be not deceived verses. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. And I want to compare that with a conspiracy theorist. So, you know the old, I think there's a Latin uh, phrase, axiom, that says if, it's, if it acts like a duck, if it walks like a duck, if it sounds like a duck, it's a duck. So when this verse says, saying, I am Christ, that tells me that the person doesn't actually have to come up and say the words to you like in a presentation, I'm the Christ, for him to give you the idea that he's saying he is the Christ, you know, by his actions, by his behaviors. So conspiracy, so the word Christ means the anointed one. Anoint means to set apart. So the conspiracy theorist may think, oh, he's the one that is anointed to set apart to tell you what's going to happen in the future. He could present himself as a Christ. And I, I, and I hope I'm not mis, uh, saying anything wrong. Uh, reminder, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are okay. Uh, oh, that just came, that's Matt's reminder. Okay, there's not somebody telling me, oh, don't forget to say that. <laughs> Technology. Okay. Uh, so the conspiracy theorist may think he's an anointed one to prophesy what's coming. Even the devil 
has his Christ. He wants to be like God. He wants to be like the Most High. I want to talk about that too in a bit. So how much time do you spend feeding on what's going on in the world? Surfing the internet, maybe even reading a lot of books. I, yeah, I don't know, but just think you need to be aware of that. In Acts 17.21, we read about the Athenians. And for all the Athenians and strangers which were, which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear not some new thing. The key here is nothing else. That's all they did. Some new thing. You think they're set up for being deceived? Now, there's nothing wrong with learning something new. I'm not trying to cast a snare on that. But we need to achieve a balance in what we do. If that's all you do is do what they did, you don't have a balanced life. Okay. Oh, boy, that was a long section. Next one is uh, number four, avoiding deception. Things that you can do to mitigate against being deceived. Beware... Be aware of what you are thinking about. Back to the verse from last week. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue. You know, this would be a good verse to, to maybe read to yourself every day, just to, for seven days in a row. Read this verse to yourself. Um, and then I'm going to consider two verses from back on part one. 2 Corinthians 10.5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth, it, exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now I want to zero in on the word captivity and thought. Bringing into captivity. What is a captive? A captive is a person that's bound. There's borders. They, they're not free to go. So bringing into captivity every thought so you remember when we're putting a border around our minds, we want to bring in every thought that will lead us to obedience of Christ. Captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ. 1 Peter 1.13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Gird means to encircle or bind with a flexible band like a belt. Right? It's a border. You want to put a border around your mind. And I'll talk about the shield of faith, too. Um, the loin is a part of a human being on, uh, or quad, quadruped on each side of the spinal column between the hip bone and the false rib. So it's, it's part of the support. You want to gird up your minds, and you want to have support there, and you want to have a shield, a border, a frame. Okay, and I'll talk about the fiery darts of the devil. Um, Manage your time wisely. Ask yourself, what do you feed on? How many hours a week do you do this? Right? It's just a check. It's just a check on yourself. If you watch television, how many hours a week? Try going without it for seven days. It's hard to find good content, as I mentioned before. If you reduce the time, this is, I think this is an important one. If you reduce the time you spend in absorbing all this stuff, then you reduce the time, your chances of feeding your mind with faulty information, which could lead to deception. That's just common sense. The less time you spend feeding on junk is the less time you need to spend exercising discernment. In other words, it takes time to separate out the chicken and throw away the bones. It takes energy and time. So the less you take in the stuff, the less you have to exercise discernment. Okay, and here's some suggestions to, what, with what to do with your time. These, you know this. This is common. This is what we've been taught. Spend more time in prayer and in the Bible. Spend more time having discussions with your family. You know, there is strength in numbers. What does the devil want to do? Isolate everybody. Isolate us. When you're isolated, you can be weak. You know, there's strength in numbers. That's what families are for. That's what this family is for, so that we can strengthen each other. Every member strengthening every member. <clears throat> okay. Let's 
Some other things you can do. You can count your blessings and be thankful. Colossians 2 6. Ask ye therefore, ask as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. You know, it reminds me of what I said the last time was walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Colossians 2 7, rooted and rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Spend more time being thankful and counting your blessings. Take time out of the day to do that. Okay, be rooted and grounded in love. Ephesians 3.16 That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Strengthened. So I talked about not being isolated. Strengthened. Ephesians 3.17 That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love. So important. Ephesians 3.18 May be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know, verse 19, the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. The love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. We don't have to know everything. We don't have to be like the Athenians. Oh man, I gotta know everything that's new out there. I gotta know what's happening. I gotta know who's doing what. Avoid being double minded. A double minded man is unstable in all his ways. James one eight. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. The heart is also used to represent the mind. Purify. You gotta take the trash out. You double-minded. And, you know, this going back and forth, being double-minded, wavering. What did Jesus say in Revelation 3.15? Be cold or hot. If you're lukewarm, we're in Christ. Think of him spewing you out of himself. That's a horrible thought. Okay. This is a, this is a message for preachers, but look what happens. 2 Timothy 4, uh, 2. This is about enduring sound doctrine. Preach the word. Be in, instant in season, out of season. Rebuke. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. 2 Timothy 4, 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. There it is. And shall be turned unto fables. Deceived. You're in the truth. You, you get to a point where you can't endure sound doctrine. And you don't have the truth. And you go to fables. That leads you right into deception. Seek wise counsel. Children, please... Pay attention to this. As you grow up, seek your parents' counsel. They know what they're talking about. They've been through it. Proverbs 24, 6. For by wise counsel thou shalt make thy war. And in, in, in multitude of counselors there is safety. We are Christian soldiers. We have a war to wage. The war is against lies and deception. The war is against what the devil wants to deceive us. It's a battle for the mind. Pastor Mott did a message years ago entitled Battle for the Mind. That was excellent. Go back and, and review that. It's very good. A Psalm of David, Psalm 103. One, remember, these are things that we can do to avoid being deceived. A Psalm of David, Psalm 101.3. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. What does that take? Most of what you can watch on television or media or whatever, they bring so much wickedness into it. I mean, my wife and I, we used to enjoy watching Wheel of Fortune and uh, Jeopardy. And it just got more and more and more. Somebody would get up, you know, can you introduce your partner now? Oh, a man says, oh, this is my husband over there sitting in the seat. I, it's gross. It was, we just tired of it. You have to just be able to say no. 
Thank you. Uh, renewing of the mind. Oh, yeah, let me finish up the Psalm of David. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes, colon, I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. There's something about putting stuff that shouldn't be there in front of your eyes that will cleave to you. You don't want that. You don't want that. You want to cleave to Jesus Christ. Okay, renewing of the mind. This is, a, this is an interesting one. I, I did a little bit of research into this one. Romans 12, 12, 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove that which is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What does renewing of the mind mean? Well, if you think about your car and you want to renew your car, you're taking broken pieces, replacing them with good pieces. So what are you doing when you renew your mind? You're taking thoughts that you shouldn't be having, thoughts that you need to, to, to throw out in the trash, you're replacing them with wholesome, godly, biblical thoughts. Think on these things. Back to our verse. What things we should be thinking about. Okay. Whew. Still got a little ways to go. Faith. The next section. Uh, this will go pretty quick. Faith, it, it is, it is what, what is faith? It's what you believe. The devil wants you to give up your faith and thereby open yourself up for deception. You think, well, how does faith play into giving up faith and you get deceived? Okay, 1 Peter 5.8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He wants you to be devoured. He wants you to be in deception. If your faith is weak, you will start doubting God, and you will start doubting if you are a child of God. So Ephesians 6.16 6, is a good one to follow up with. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now, what is a shield? Well, you know, in warfare, a shield is basically sort of a flat piece of armor. But when you think about the shield of faith, you're protecting what you believe. That means you're going to have a shield around your mind. You want to protect yourself against the fiery darts of the wicked. When they come at you and you have a metal shield around your head, I'm figured to, I'm, you know, using this just as an explanation. The darts are going to bounce off. They won't sting you. You're not going to get hit by them. You're not, they're not going to penetrate. So that's why it's so important that we have a strong faith. And that's why the devil wants to get your faith down. Because he knows what's going to happen next. All right. Uh, Peter, Matthew 14, 27. Uh, Straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Okay, he's out in a boat, or no, he's walking on water, and they were in the boat. Be not afraid. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. This is Matthew fourteen twenty-eight and 29. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Verse 30. But when he saw the wind boisterous, Okay, he got distracted. This is what the devil's doing. He wants to distract everybody with all the busy, busy, busy lifestyles. You've got to be doing all these things. No, you don't have to. You, don't, you really don't have to. Um, so when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? See, the devil wants you to doubt. <clears throat> you know, we pray, we've been praying for this bridge. We continue to pray for this bridge to be open. To, you know, so that our Canadian members can come to church. We'd love to have them here. We miss them so much. And we pray for God to open that bridge. So far, it's not open. 
I mean, except for certain cases, as I understand. But you may say, well, maybe some people have said, well, the government's not going to open that bridge. Now think about what you just said. You know, where's your faith? You believe that God spoke the universe into existence, right? Uh, I'm keep work I'm going to keep working on it. Uh, you believe that God spoke the uh, universe into existence. And God is so infinitely powerful. And, and I, I hope I can bring this point out without, I hope you can understand this. There's no difference to God between speaking a universe into existence and opening a bridge. Do you get that? There's no difference. If God says, bridge be open, it's going to be open. So don't, don't give the government more power than, than they really have. God is allowing this to happen. It's just as easy for him to do anything. He's so infinitely powerful. We must keep that in mind. And that will help strengthen our faith. Okay. Educating your children. Whew. I've got to move on. I've got to speed up a little bit here. Okay. Um, I'm just going to read a few of these verses. Uh, if you want, I can send you this uh, outline and you can go through the verses. Um, basically, what I'm going to say is that According to the Bible, the parents are responsible and they have the right and duty to be involved in the education of their children. And don't you want your children to be educated so they can discern and not get deceived, you know, later on down the road, be able to discern and see, okay, this is not true. What this person is telling me is not true or it sounds too good to be true. You know, be aware, be on guard. Um, so uh, let's see, Psalm 78.4. We will not hide them. This, this would be like the, the law of God. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to the children. So it's primarily the father's job, but many times it's the parent's job to do this, your fathers are working, the mothers are, you know, homeschooling. Um, but it's so important. I'm just using these verses to say that educating your children about this is so extremely important. There was something I heard a while ago. I'm not sure where this came from. It might have been somebody that supports Karl Marx. They said, "Give me your children, and in a generation, I will transform your nation." Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, Deuteronomy 6, 7, thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk with them. This is spending time with them. It's so important <clears throat> that when thou walkest by the way, uh, sorry, thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up. Proverbs 22.6, train, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Hebrews 5.14, but strong meat belongeth to them that are full of age, even to those who by reason of use have their senses ex exercised to discern both good and evil. Stress that point. Have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And ye fathers, Ephesians 6, 4, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Okay, moving on. Dealing with this pandemic, you know, God can take an evil thing, he has done many times, and make something good out of it. And look at us, right? We were broken, we were sinners. He took us and saved us. Jesus Christ died for us, saved us. He's transformed us. So there's this thing about the pandemic that I've learned. And I'm, I'm just calling this the COVID awakening. Okay, so what's happened was because of the pandemic, the students had to learn from home using Zoom or the like. Therefore, parents got to know what the children are being taught. Okay, and I'll use Virginia as an example. And I think it's sometime, maybe starting about a year ago, maybe a little bit less, that the parents were starting to realize what their children were being taught, 
right? Ooh. And uh, uh, once this started becoming known, it spread across the country like wildfire. And they're like wildfire. And in Virginia and other states, this has like become a movement. And people started, parents started going to the uh, school board meetings, and there was a lot of hot arguments and so forth going on. Uh, sadly, this demonstrated that many parents in our country were asleep at the wheel. Shame on. Shame on them. Parents must, <clears throat> parents must get time with their children. Busy, busy, busy. I've already talked about this. The devil has everyone running. So in Virginia, for example, the parents were going to these school board meetings. It was a hot topic. There was much controversy. The school board, somebody in the school boards put, sent a letter to the U.S. Attorney General. And I'm just sort of kind of going through this quickly. I don't know if I have it exact. But the basic idea is they sent a letter to the U.S. Attorney General demanding action. We've got these parents showing up at our meetings, and they're really upset, and they're arguing, and they're yelling, and you can't teach our children this. So good for the parents. Uh, <clears throat> and then the Attorney General sent a memo to the FBI. This is unbelievable. And the letter said they want the FBI to show up at these school board meetings to deal with these parents who he labeled them as domestic terrorists. It's crazy. But you see the opposition. Do you see what the devil's fighting for? So a few months ago, and by the way, good for your homeschoolers, and I don't want to cast this scenario on anybody that sends their kids to, you know, outside to a school for, for education, but you're still responsible to know what your children are learning and what they're being exposed to. So important. So a few months ago, there was this race for the governor of Virginia. And this is, this, is, this is kind of interesting. The candidates held a debate. And just as a reminder, in Loudoun County, Virginia, and other counties, there's this sweeping movement about what's going on in our schools. What are the children being taught? So they had a debate between uh, Glenn Youngkin and Terry McAuliffe. Terry McAuliffe was ahead in the polls three, three weeks before the election if you can believe the polls, that's another whole thing. Terry McAuliffe made a fatal mistake in the debate. He said, quote, I don't think parents should be telling schools what they should teach. He sank and lost the election because of that, within weeks. Huge idiot, huge mistake. Okay, end times, we're at the final section. Not doing too bad. Um, I got a couple verses on who is Satan, but uh, what, the main point I want to bring out here is that Satan wants to be like the Most High. He, he's fallen. He's a fallen angel. He was cast out. He's cast down to the ground. Uh, you know, uh, Isaiah fourteen thirteen. For has for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. By the way, that's where God dwells. Uh, I, Isaiah 14:14. 14, 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So, Satan wants to be like God. But the way he wants to be like God and what he wants to do is through lies and deception and deceiving the nations. So, <clears throat> Revelation 20, verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Verse 2. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So we, we, know, that, we know that that happened. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Does it seem like he's been loosed? Probably for a while, I guess. I, you know, I don't know. But, uh, so Rev, so his, his, his aspiration, motivation 
is he wants to be like God, which means he wants worshipers. He wants followers, right? And the thing that he does is he motivates nations through deception to come up against God's people. And we're going to see that it's going to happen here. Uh, it's played out in Revelation. It tells us this is going to happen. And when the Revelation chapter 20, verse 7, Satan is going to lead a massive deception in the last days. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. A thousand years being explained in the Bible as a relatively long period of time. Revelation 28, and, he shall, and shall go out to deceive the nations, which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people in these nations that he's deceiving. Verse 9, and they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. Okay, so here you are. You're a believer. You're a true believer of Jesus Christ. And you're in the camp of the saints. And I don't know how this actually plays out geographically, but you're encircled by these deceived people, nations of being deceived. And you've got to wonder, what are they thinking? What are they thinking that, what is their deception? They're thinking that somehow the people of God are a threat to them, to their way of life. You know, I don't know. I'll just somehow they're deceived into thinking we're their enemy. We're not their enemy. Amen. We're followers of Jesus Christ. Why are we a threat to them? But somehow they're deceived into thinking that we're a threat to them. You know, these days they talk about our nation being divided. I don't really know if it's so divided, but the message is going out. You're divided. You got the right and the left. You got the Democrats and Republicans. You know, I, I wish people wouldn't be focused on we're divided. There's something that you're doing that's threatening my life. No, that's not right. Everybody should be trusting in God, trusting in God to preserve their life, to help them, I should say, through this life. Um, so what happens is they go up on the breadth of the earth and compass the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. <laughs> it reminds me of something. I believe I heard this in a movie years ago. You've got this battalion of you know in the army, and they're out at war, and they're in warfare, and one of, the, one of the sergeants or whatever comes up to the captain and says, Captain, sir, we sent scouts out and we're totally surrounded by the enemy. The captain said, good, we must not let them escape. <laughs> um, so what happens? This is like an 11th hour deliverance. Amen. The beloved city, the camp, saints about in the beloved city, and then fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. You think about that. God is infinite, infinitely power. He can do anything. You've got probably millions and millions of people as the sand of the sea. Nations all gathered against the camp of the saints. Gone like that. And the devil, <laughs> this is the good news here. And the devil, verse 10, was that was deceived Sorry, the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, um, <clears throat> I just had these couple of verses I thought of last night and I, and I, I wanted to bring this in. It, it fits in good with the idea of beware of deception. Matthew twenty four twenty three. <clears throat> then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. There's deceivers. Tw verse 24, For there shall arise false Christ, false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. You see how important it is? Now, I... My topic is not the mark of the beast, but I want to explain a couple of things here. I do not know what the mark of the beast is. I don't think anybody does except God. And if they tell you they know, they're probably deceiving you. Um, the, here's a couple of things, and pastors taught this, that if you're, if you're engaged in 
worshiping the true God and worshiping in spirit and truth, you don't have to worry about receiving the mark of the beast. The people that receive the mark of the beast are deceived, engaged in false worship, and they're all about looking at the wonders of the miracles, right? So, there I go again, right? Uh, <clears throat> so, if you're engaged in seeking the truth and in true worship, you don't have to worry about it. You, have, you don't, have, you know, it's it's not the vaccine. It's in uh, what what country is it? Middle Eastern country, I think, is putting chips in people's hands. Hey, we got a program. You can put your Vax card in your hand. Sweden, right? Yes. You can you can implant a chip. Is that the mark of the beast? Probably not. In fact, do you know um, where the devil wants to be like the Most High? We know that we've been taught that we don't have a choice in receiving the gift of life. Remember how a pastor taught us you can receive things two ways, actively or passively? How do you know when people receive the mark of the beast, is it going to be actively, like you're waiting in line to get a chip implanted? Or is it going to be passively and they don't, they're not even really aware of what happened or even had a choice in the matter? How do you know that? Um, so I have a final verse. I'm going to leave that uh, topic. I just wanted to maybe bring up a point about deception and that the point is if you're not deceived you don't have to worry about receiving the mark of the beast okay I, I, I just wanted to bring that up so for the final verse and uh, ooh, we're a little over uh, open your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians 3 and we'll read together verses 1 through 4 2 Thessalonians 3. Let me get there here. Okay. Uh, and I, I'd like this to be, as we read this together, imagine that each one of you... So I'm thinking of the idea about the church edifies itself. We edify each other. We help each other. So when we read this, when you think about that, you are reading it to every other member in the church in this room. So as we read this, we're reading it to ourselves. Okay. Okay. Chapter three, verse one together. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. You, that you will both do and... Uh, okay, that's good. I, uh, so, thank you for doing that, and I would like to add my own little prayer uh, relating to deliver us, yeah, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, and also that we may be delivered from deceivers. Amen. Thank you so much for your kind and patient attention. Praise God.